Okay. I just logged on, and if anyone can see me, uh, please let me know. Alright, is anyone on? I may be talking to no one. All right, so is there anyone on this? Anyone going to listen? All right, well, I'll talk anyways. Um, hopefully, people will join. This talk is going to be about how to get your child from, uh, you know, your homeschooling child into Harvard. And it's not just Harvard. Um, you know, it's, it's into the institution that is best suited for him or her. Um, but uh, you know, most people just look at Harvard as sort of like the end-all, be-all, you know, the ultimate college to go to. So that's why I often use Harvard uh, as an example. But uh, you know, homeschooling is fabulous for many reasons. Uh, as I just talked about on Channel One, it's great for living an independent existence. Uh, you know, it's it's great um, for people who want to be free and for people who believe in liberty. Um, you know, and uh, you know those are reasons enough why most uh, people should at least consider homeschooling. Um, but if your focus is on getting your child into an elite college or university, there really isn't much of a better um, option than homeschooling, um, other than perhaps you know being the son or daughter of a senator or of a rich business tycoon um, or being a a highly sought after recruited athlete um, you know so uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and focus on how to get your homeschooling kid into Harvard and why uh, getting them into Harvard uh, through homeschooling is is probably one of the highest uh, bet you know one of the you know from a probability perspective one of the best bets that you can make um, they're certainly uh, not going to have an easy path gain there through the public school system uh, quick about me uh, I'll give uh, I, I will give a introduction that's a little bit more substantial than I gave in the last uh, talk over on Channel One because that was more about liberty, um, how how homeschooling is going to be good for the liberty liberty movement. But here I think that my my personal story is a little a little bit more um, uh, contextual, I guess you could say. So I am from a small town in Pennsylvania. I was the first person in my family graduate high school. I went to a public high school um, and then I was then obviously the first person in my family to, to go to college. I went to United States Military Academy at West Point um, which as I said over there is about as status as they come. Um, so uh, you know and, and that's that's just the reality of it and I spent many years being a status believing that the government was great. People who opposed the government were were unpatriotic and that people who criticized the government, you know, just you know, didn't get it. Um, but I grew up a lot along the way. 
Oh, am I logging on? Am I not on? Okay, so I just got a message asking if I was logging on. I thought I was on. Uh, can someone confirm that they can see me? Okay, well, some people can see me. I think people can hear me. So I will keep going. If you can't, just let me know. Um, but I can actually see myself on channel 2, and I can hear myself. So I think that that's a good sign. Okay, <laughs> alright, no problem. Um, so, so as I was saying, um, you know, I went into the Army. Afterwards, I was an Airborne Ranger, and I spent tours in Kosovo and Iraq. Afterwards, I got out. I went to Stanford for business school. Then I went into investment banking and then private equity. So yes, um, I know that my resume is unfortunately more in line with someone like Mitt Romney than uh, than a true liberty lover. But I've I've grown a lot over the past uh, three years. Ever since 2009, um, you know, I, I've come to embrace liberty and uh, reject the state um, to a degree, even though I still support Ron Paul. Um, but uh, but this this topic is about getting your kid from uh, homeschooling into Harvard. Uh, so you know I've I've applied to four colleges in my life: uh, Army, uh, uh, Stanford, uh, Harvard Business School, and Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I've never been rejected by any of them. And that is not because I am extremely intelligent or better than anyone else. It's because getting into schools is as much a game as it is uh, you know, meritocracy. Uh, schools are looking for certain things in certain people and if you don't understand the rules of the game you're probably not going to do very well in the game and admissions is a game. There's a lot of great reasons to go to schools like Harvard and Stanford um, and uh, it opens up a lot of doors. It gives you a lot of access to uh, it has gives you a lot of access to uh, you know, a, a very powerful network it gives you access to um, opportunities. It, it gets your foot in the door uh, for certain career fields. Um, there's a lot of benefits to going to these schools. Uh, they, the benefits don't justify going to these schools necessarily, especially if you have to pay a lot of money to go there, and if you have to give up something in your life, you know, through uh, your your integrity or or you know opportunity cost. Um, but in general, if uh, if a student is able to get into a place like Harvard or Stanford, I would uh, I would tend to encourage them to at least uh, go for a semester to see if they like it and uh, you know get what they can out of it to include uh, access to the alumni database. Um, you know, but I had never been rejected uh, to any of these schools, and then I went ahead and started helping other people get into these schools. So I worked when I was in New York uh, for three years. I worked with uh, students all across the city, helping them get into the service academies um, back when I was a big supporter of the service academies. Um, but I figured out the process. I worked with the admissions department. I became uh, a representative for two congressional districts there, and I ran all the college fairs in New York uh, for, for uh, West Point. So I got to understand that. I started working with the Stanford uh, admissions department as well. I got to understand that. Um, and then I started uh, doing consulting for money, uh, for MBA consulting, and I, I just figured out how to get people in the Harvard Business School. My acceptance rate in the Harvard Business School through the people that I work with, through the people who listen to me, is about 80%. The actual acceptance rate for Harvard is around 11 or 12%. So obviously, um, you know, what I was doing was working for my clients, and my acceptance rate for Stanford was about 25 percent, which uh, compared to the 80 percent at Harvard wasn't necessarily all that great, but they have an acceptance rate of the general population of around 7 percent. You know, so so I, I get it. I understand what schools are looking for to a degree, and I understand that it's a game, and that's the way that people need to that's the way people need to look at places like Harvard and Stanford, Princeton, Yale, MIT, 
um, all those places if that's where they're trying to go with their homeschool kit. Um, I'm going to actually walk through uh, before I get into how homeschoolers will get into school. I'm going to walk through how difficult it is to get into these schools if you're an average kid. So I'm down here in Texas, so this is going to have a bit of a Texas flavor to it. But I'm going to look at uh, the, the next the five schools: Harvard, which is, uh, you know, as far as most people are concerned, uh, either the best or one of the top three schools in the world. Uh, Cornell, which is an Ivy League school, but it's considered the uh, the least rigorous, uh, easiest to get into Ivy League school. Rice, um, a very good school here in Texas. University of Texas, you know, sort of the uh, the standard for uh, Texas State schools, and then Texas Tech, which is uh, a very good school, but um, you know, for as, as far as public schools go, but you know, just not quite up to the uh, standard of, of the University of Texas. So admissions rate for these schools: Harvard, 6.2 percent; Cornell, 18 percent; Rice, 21 percent; UT goes up to 47 percent, and Texas Tech goes up to 72 percent. So. You know, there are certain schools where getting into schools is very unlikely for the average applicant, and then other schools where getting rejected is sort of the exception. Um, you know, the SAT scores, uh, you know, for these schools, you know, Harvard's uh, 75th percentile SAT in reading, math, and writing is 800, 790, 800. That means 25 percent, you know, score that, you know, above that or 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 at that number. So, uh, you know, that that's that's pretty. Uh, Pretty daunting for a kid who thinks that they're doing really well and has uh, 700s on their SATs. Um, Cornell 730 and 770. Rice drops, you know, is actually higher than Cornell 750, 790, and 760. UT, this is where it starts dropping off. Uh, remarkably, 660, 700, 660. And then Texas Tech, it drops all the way down to 580, 610, and 570. You know, so you know, there's obviously a, you know, a tears when it comes to uh, colleges. Um, and their admission standards, and those uh, and those tiers tend to correspond uh, in general with sort of the prestige of the school, the brand of the school, and the opportunities that come out of that school. And so, you know, my focus for uh, all you homeschool parents out there or future homeschoolers is to uh, understand how to beat that system, how to uh, be in a part of that 6.2 percent admissions rate at Harvard or at um, other Ivy League or Ivy League associated uh, or uh, like schools um, and you know 6.2 percent does sound pretty daunting there's no question about it but as daunting as that number sounds the chances of it, your child getting into Harvard through public schooling is remarkably lower than 6.2 percent even though the range for SAT reading from the 25th to 75th percentile is 690 to 800 for an average public school kid if they're scoring in the middle of that range, around a 750, they're not getting to Harvard. And, uh, and this is just something that parents don't understand. They think that if they look at the class profile and they meet the average or they, they clear certain hurdles that they're going to get into these schools. It's just not the case, unfortunately. Um, you, know, you have a much lower chance of getting in to Harvard uh, through public schooling, through traditional schooling, um, you know, than you think. And, uh, and I'm going to actually walk through the average uh, class at Harvard to sort of highlight this. So I looked at the uh, Harvard class, I believe, of 2010 or 2011, and, um, and I'll even write some of these numbers down. So in that class, um, 34,950 students applied to Harvard. Okay? Of that, 2,160 were accepted, and 1700 matriculated. Now those who didn't matriculate to Harvard tended to matriculate to a select number of schools. Yale, Princeton, um, Stanford, maybe some MIT, and Caltech. Like Those are schools that people would typically turn down Harvard for. There's not really many others that people would. So you see that about 460 students uh, you know, opted not to go to Harvard you know, that year. You know, and they were going to one of those other schools, which meant they got into one of those other schools. So, uh, pretty impressive people, you would think, uh, from the get-go. But what we don't see in these numbers is the number of students who applied who were world-class athletes, who were student athletes, who were faculty children, who were legacy children, who were developmental cases, um, 
who are minorities, and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and explain all those things here uh, in a minute. But you know that cohort is actually much much smaller than the numbers that you see there. The 34,950, you know, that is largely filled with average applicants who are applying from public schools. And when I say average, I don't mean you know not hitting you know the top of the range when it comes to SAT and whatnot. I'm talking about valedictorians, people who graduated at the top of their class. You know, at public schools, people who are class presidents, people who are captains of the football team, you know, captains of the volleyball team, and people who were, uh, you know, um, on in multiple clubs and in leadership positions. That's the average applicant to Harvard. They have more people apply that are valedictorians in high school than they have slots available uh, in the class. So the average applicant to Harvard, it, it, who's already self-selecting to a degree, is a pretty impressive person. Um, but the people that they accept aren't necessarily pretty impressive people. So of this 34,950 who applied and the, of the 22,160 uh, 2, who were accepted, I'm, I'm going to actually walk through what the chances are of an average person, meaning a very accomplished uh, student in public schools, you know, what their chances are. So this is something a lot of people n recognize but they don't realize exactly how big the number is. Student athletes. Kids who play on NCAA sports, um, and it's at, almost at all schools. This is a major, major uh, component of the class. At Harvard, 20% of the student body is a student athlete. So this means that they play some sport for the school. You know that is pretty substantial. And you know, not not all of them, um, you know, are competing. You know, got into Harvard because of their athletic ability. Some of them got in and then decided to play sport. But of the student athletes, you know, we can go ahead and discount about 75% of them. Those are people who are not competing with the average person who's applying uh, to Harvard. So we got student athletes. 20% of, of the class, um, and and we're going to discount 75%. Uh, uh, we're going to discount 75% uh, that aren't going to compete with us or the average kid. So that's uh, 324 uh, accepted students that your child would not be competing with because th that slot's already given already given to those kids. And so your uh, 2,160 just dropped by 324. Okay, then we move on to underrepresented minorities, and this is just uh, what you call uh, yeah, Jordan. Uh, as I said previously, I don't know if you just got on the call, you know. You know, this this Harvard is the way that I talk about all uh, sort of highly selective colleges and universities. Uh, you may not want to go Harvard. You you may not uh, care if your kid goes, uh, you know, to any selective university. This this is a uh, you know focus on people who want to get their kids into those schools. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why they would want to go. There's a lot of reasons why maybe they wouldn't. Uh, my focus on Liberty was over on Channel One. Um, you know, so this is just really directed towards parents who are or who want their kids to go to these schools. Uh, we, there's certainly a, a very, very good argument to be made that you know going to these schools is not worth it. Uh, I'm just not going to get into that uh, right here. Um, so going back to the underrepresented minority uh, case, you know th that's primarily Black, Hispanic, and Native American. And the interesting thing about underrepresented minorities is that it, it actually hurts. Uh, it actually hurts underrepresented, uh, underrepresented minorities in a lot of ways. The uh, the children who typically uh, take advantage of uh, you know these policies in the black community are immigrant children or uh, very very rich black families, and the uh, the poor blacks you know they don't benefit from it, um, and they actually uh, get hurt by it because of this negative uh, association of blacks not being able to compete and uh, you know get by on you know through their own hard work. Uh, so. You know, uh, unfortunately, it's it's a very negative thing all around, and and uh, you know, all of you uh, people who believe in in freedom and free markets and all that, I don't need to argue this point to you. Um, you know, but the standards are much lower uh, in a lot of these colleges, uh, in most colleges, when it comes to underrepresented minorities, and uh, about 25 percent of the class at Harvard uh, is an underrepresented minority, which is you know that that's a huge amount. Um, and I will go ahead and say that 70% of those people, you know, aren't going to fall into one of these other buckets that I'm talking about. So underrepresented minorities, 
and then you know that leaves us with 378 students who are accepted that your kids won't compete with. So you, we just subtracted, uh, you know, uh, close to 700 kids from the uh, 2,160 that were accepted to Harvard. That your kid, if you're an average white person or an Asian person, um, you know, who doesn't play play uh, you know a sport at a very high level, you know, you, that you're not competing for those slots. Then there are faculty kids. You know, this is pretty uh, a pretty significant uh, subset. You know, it's only four percent, but that four percent matters. You know, so th those kids have a much easier path to getting into these colleges uh, than your kid does. You know, and and that would lead to 86 kids who are accepted um, that your kids aren't going to be competing with. Then we have legacy. Uh, this 18 uh, percent um, in 2002. That's the la latest uh, number I could get for Harvard. Was uh, were legacy children. That meant that one of their parents went to Harvard. Um, you know, not all of those children wouldn't otherwise gain acceptance. Um, some of those because their parents went to Harvard work extremely hard. But I estimate that 20% of that group, uh, you know, wouldn't have otherwise gotten in. They have an easier path uh, to acceptance. So that's uh, another 78 kids that are accepted that aren't that aren't competing with your kids. Okay. And then finally, um, this is a, you know, it, it's kind of a secret. You know, most people don't realize this, but it, it's huge. There's development cases. And these are the children of extremely rich and powerful people. Um, you know, sometimes the children of politicians as well. I, I group them in here, although they're not technically development cases, but they receive the same benefits. Um, you know, Steven Spielberg's daughter was an example of, the, you know, one of these people as well. But, you know, if if there's a billionaire, if there's a billion out, billionaire out there, or someone who's willing to spend forty million dollars on on a a new building at a school, you know, someone who's willing to buy a new baseball stadium, stuff like that, those kids are getting in, and those kids get in with much, much, much lower standards uh, than than the other groups, even lower than the uh, underrepresented minorities, and it's a significant uh, segment of the population. You know, it's about two to three percent. You know, at some of these elite schools. The thing is, is that that two to three percent, you know, while while it may seem small, um, they come in with uh, very very questionable scores, and those scores have to be made up for elsewhere, including all these uh, all these other people. So that just increases, you know, sort of the uh, you know the hurdle for a child to get in. But uh, development cases, that's another forty kids out of that class. Okay. Now, if you add all that together. You know, you get 906 uh, admits from a class that had 2,160 admits. So 906 of them were uh, kids who had an easier path to getting accepted that your kid or an average kid will not compete with. So that 6.2% very daunting um, acceptance rate at Harvard drops all the way down to 3.6%. So your chance, the chances of your kid getting in to Harvard even if they're valedictorian, even if they're student body president, you know, if they're if they're white and they're not um, a recruited athlete or have any of the, these other hooks, their chances of getting in are less than one in 25. So that's something that uh, we should all be mindful of when we think about you know what it takes to get into these schools. Um, but now I'll tell you why homeschooling is the best option for your kids if you want them to get into these schools. Uh, there's two reasons. Uh, if you want to be among the four percent that get into the into the school, being valedictorian means nothing. Being student body president means nothing, and being captain of three uh, sports teams means nothing. You know they have more than enough people who are doing that, and they have plenty of kids in the class who who aren't quite pulling their weight. You know, but they were brought in for some of the reasons I told you before, and so they're looking to fill out their class with really exceptional people who are going to add a lot of value uh, to the class and be successful and be people that they can go ahead and brag about um, you know 20 or 30 years down the road when they win a Nobel Prize or or when, when, when they when they're running a company or whatever it is and uh, the way that they measure that uh, you know in part largely is uh, through through two means one is uh, through um, intellectual vitality and intellectual vitality and the other is, uh, you know, just by accomplishments. Uh, I'll go ahead and talk about accomplishments first. You know, it's critical that a child become extremely good 
at something and extremely passionate about something. Uh, they should become an expert in something. And uh, unfortunately, when you go to a public school, if you're the best basketball player in the school, you think you're you're really cool. You think that you're great. If you are the best math student in the school, you think that you're great. The problem is, is that you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that great. You know, public schools are terrible institutions to begin with. Most kids there have been, you know, they've lost their love of learning. And rising to the top of a public institution, it requires endurance to a degree because you have to be able to fight the urge to give up on education like the rest of the kids. But the fact that you're at the top of a public education institution, you know, is not very compelling to these schools. What they want to see is that you have truly become an expert, that you have truly mastered something, and that you care about something in your life. And uh, th this is where homeschoolers have a tremendous advantage over public schoolers and kids that even go to elite prep schools such as Andover and Exeter. Um, you know, with homeschooling, you have a lot of time to focus on something that you really care about. And when I say you, I'm talking about the child. Um, with a private school or with public school, you are in school an average of six and a half to seven hours a day for 180 days a year for 13 years. That's a tremendous amount of time that you are locked up, not able to do what you really want to do, what you love to do, what you can become really good at. And the the travesty of the travesty of all that is that you're not even getting anything out of it, you know, because the education component is so terrible. There, you know, the average amount of time that um, someone is learning in school that they're receiving instruction during that six and a half to seven hours a day you know is typically between two and three and a half hours you know so they're not even not even a half their day is uh, instruction it's it's being filled with things like uh, study halls lunches homerooms moving between classes taking uh, ridiculous tests that do nothing to to help develop the child uh, dealing with the uh, discipline issues disruptions in classes these are all things that that happen in public schools that don't happen in homeschooling and with with that those hours saved and without having to do uh, you know repetitive uh, mindless homework you know your child can go ahead and develop something that they're really good at and that they're really passionate about and it doesn't have to be something that you know everyone is expecting of them if they want to become the best fencer in the world they should go ahead and fence a lot. If they want to do karate, they should do that. If they want to do equestrian sports, do that. You know, but it doesn't have to be sports either. It could be if they want to become the best geologist, you know, in the world, they should be out there, you know, digging up the ground, looking at rocks, uh, categorizing things, working with other people, you know, writing papers. You know, these are the things that are going to make them stand out. You know, they are going to develop knowledge, become very, very good at something. And when they apply to these schools, you know, it's not just going to be test scores. And by the way, home scores rock the SAT if they care to stare for it, uh, study for it because, uh, because their reading and verbal skills are off the charts. Um, you know, but, but, but SAT score isn't enough. You know, as, I, as I've already pointed out, you can have a perfect SAT score and you're not getting into Harvard. You know, you need something else. You need to become an expert at something. You need to become really, really good at something. And what the the charge for homeschooling parents is to figure out what it is that their kid really cares about, loves about, is passionate about, and is willing to uh, put tremendous time into uh, to become uh, even better at it. And unlike most things that come through education, where where uh, we we beat up kids and, and and we tell them that they, that they need to do certain things in order to be successful, you know, um, and and it's painful for them. You know, if it's something that they love, you know, it's a win-win. You know, they are they're building their knowledge, they're building a skill set, they're becoming great at something, and they don't see it as a chore. They see it as as a way that they're living their life. You know, whether it's it's playing golf or whether or whether it's uh, composing music or or writing uh, short stories, whatever it is. You know, let them run with it, um, encourage them, uh, and let them become great at it. And when it comes time to apply to Harvard, that is what's going to really stand out. Um, if it's a, if it's athletics, you know, even better because uh, the the bar for athletics, you know, uh, is even lower. Um, so, so become an expert at something. That's what you want to encourage your kid to do. And in homeschooling, you have the opportunity to do that in a way that you cannot in any other form of schooling whatsoever. And when I say homeschooling, I include unschooling uh, in this. Um, you know, I just I just say homeschooling for convenience sake. 
So that's one. The second one is intellectual vitality. And this is something that schools really care about. There is a former admissions dean at Stanford who wrote the very first guidelines for uh, homeschoolers to get accepted into Stanford. Stanford has been extremely uh, homeschool friendly, as most schools have, um, but Stanford even more so over the years since the 80s. And their acceptance rate for homeschoolers tends to run around the 25 to 30 percent uh, mark, which is huge considering that the uh, acceptance rate for the school as a whole is under 10 percent. So you know you're you're doing you're, you're doing great if you're a homeschooler from the get-go. Your chances just uh, dramatically improve. And and the reason why is is intellectual vitality. You know when they have so few slots available for kids um, who aren't athletes, who aren't development cases, who aren't underrepresented minorities, you know, who don't fit into these buckets that these schools are are, are trying to fill. Um, you know that then the remaining kids are the ones that they really expect to lift the uh, the the quality of ed education and, and and to create the educational environment that they're looking for, one that you know seeks out answers and, and one that you know is, is able to uh, you know uh, support the brand uh, you know that the legacy that these schools have built up as great institutions of education, even though oftentimes that's that that's completely false. Uh, uh, a false legacy, but you know that's what they're trying to uh, that's what they're trying to uh, support. So intellectual vitality is the measure that they use uh, to determine uh, you know if your child is going to be part of that community. Uh, and intellectual vitality, they typically rate it on a scale of one to five, five being the best. And homeschoolers typically are off the charts. They're typically a five. You know, meanwhile the average you know. Average. When I say average, I'm talking about Val Victorian, uh, perfect score on the SAT. They're not getting a five on intellectual vitality, and that intellectual vitality score is far more important than being student class president or being captain of a football team. You know, it is this belief that the child seeks to understand the world around them, seeks knowledge, is inquisitive, is always questioning, is trying to to create uh, solutions, trying to trying to master. Uh, you know, knowledge. That's what intellectual vitality is. You know, when they look at at uh, you know a piece of furniture, they don't just see a piece of furniture. They see you know how it was constructed. They they see the engineering behind it. They see you know how how it's used in society. You know, relative to at other points in time in society. You know, these these are sort of the things that they see with intellectual vitality. And homeschoolers have. Uh, an unparalleled advantage when it comes to to being off the charts on intellectual vitality, because we can go back to becoming an expert. Because they tend to be able to focus in on something that they really care about and learn a lot about it and become really good at it. And if it's anything that has to do with uh, academics, you know, an academic function or 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 a field, you know, they're going to become really good at it. And it's going to be obvious that these kids love learning. They seek out learning not because they're being told to by a teacher that they have to finish chapter two by by tomorrow, you know. But they're learning for the for the sake of learning, for the love of learning, and uh, it and, and because it's a non-course environment, because homeschooling uh, is so often uh, student-led, you know, it just becomes apparent that their intellectual vitality is off the charts. And then when these kids, you know, if there's an interview and they come in and talk. You know, during this interview, they can talk about what they're actually doing. The average school, the, the average kid, the average valedictorian at an average school, you know, they can talk about their grades, but they but they can't talk passionately about you know the things that they're studying about you know pre-revolutionary American history, colonial history, or they can't talk passionately about you know uh, evolutionary psychology or or uh, you know any any number of things that they might you know otherwise be really really passionate about if they were in a homeschooling environment so when when you have children who have this intellectual vitality and you have children who are experts at something and you bring those two things together that is where you change uh, dramatically that 3.6 per percent chance of gaining in Harvard into a much more reasonable manageable number where you can get into the school and Stanford and Princeton you know, and Caltech even, which is the hardest school to get into, and and then from there, you know, it, we can go back to uh, Jordan's uh, point. You know, is it right for them? You know, is this what they want to do? Is the debt worth it? 
you know, you know, are are they going down a path which is going to make them, uh, you know, happy and content with life? Which is all fine. You know, those questions are good questions to ask. You know, you don't want to push kids into into these schools just because. But uh, but if you want the, if you want the kid to have the chance to get into these schools, you know, you really want to focus on helping them become an expert at something and on developing their intellectual vitality. And there's no better way to do that than through homeschooling. I am a homeschooling uh, expert. I focus in on homeschooling. I help parents with homeschooling um, and with uh, admissions. And I also help uh, people with MBA admissions. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. I hope that this was helpful. Um, what I tried to do was highlight, you know, how the your real chances of getting into these schools, uh, how homeschooling is a superior alternative, uh, and and the two things that you need to focus in on as a homeschooler to get your children into these schools, and that is becoming an expert at something and intellectual vitality. So if anyone has any questions, I would uh, be happy to answer them. Uh, doesn't even have to stick to this topic. Uh, we can talk about education in general, homeschooling in general. We can talk about whether college is worth it. Um, you know, but just go ahead and, and fire away. Hopefully I didn't lose everyone in the process. Yeah, what does the uh, Harvard grad bring to society? Well, not much if they're immoral, right? Um, you know, we have lots of Harvard grads who have done great damage to society. Uh, we can look at our last two presidents as prime examples of that. Um, you know, Harvard grads, the fact that they're grads of Harvard doesn't mean anything. Um, it, it, it just means that they got into a school, and which is the, by far the hardest part, and then they graduate from the school. Um, the question is, is what can Harvard do for your child? Can it open doors? Can it introduce them to people and opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have? And is it an environment where they can go ahead and, and broaden their horizons? Uh, to a degree that they wouldn't be able to through a, an alternative uh, opportunity uh, such as traveling or working and that's a question that I think is a very valid question I think when I talk about business school um, you know, people ask me all the time about going to business school I tell them that business school is not an option for everyone it, it's a bad option for most people and, uh, if, and some people if they're not going to Stanford or Harvard which are the two best business schools you know, it's not even worth going to. There's other people going to a top five is, is what makes it worth it. Other people, top ten. You know, it all depends on what they want to get out of it, where they're coming from in life, and, and where, where they're trying to go to. Uh, as an aside, I am very active on the West Point forums on LinkedIn, and I have been very, very critical of the government, of, of our society in general, and I've been pointing out to these, uh, these West Point graduates you know how corrupt our government is, and and how silent our alumni base is regarding uh, the corruption. Considering that we are supposed to be uh, an institution that pushes out people of high integrity and morality, and uh, and and they just don't. And I get into fights with these people all the time about it. I've been kicked off one of them. Um, I'm probably going to kicked off the other one any day now. Um, and and it's, it's very frustrating because you're dealing with people that society deems as being very moral and and they give them such benefits and such leeway and, and reverence for being this this group of, of high integrity uh, high moral uh, character people and it's just not true and so you know when you ask me well what does West what does a West Pointer bring to society I would say not really much um, you know West Pointers are more likely to be status than the average person so probably even less they're taking highly qualified kids from high school, and then they're corrupting them, uh, and and then they come out even worse. You know, and is that the case with Harvard as well? Yeah, probably. But you know, if you go into it, if you have an understanding of liberty uh, from the get-go, and you go into these schools, you do have opportunities. I'm a West Pointer. I've learned my ways. I now I use West Point, um, you know, as a way to spread liberty. You know, I talk to West Pointers about it. You know, I. I I attack this notion that we need to go around, you know, fighting wars all around the world to protect our freedoms. You know, and as a West Pointer, that has a little bit more validity. And if your child goes to Harvard, 
and they uh, plan on you know uh, being a liberty activists in the future, you know that's going to just get them more uh, you know benefit of the doubt from from the average layperson. Do they deserve it because they graduated from Harvard? Absolutely not. But it, but that's the way society is. Yeah, I mean, if if more libertarians get into the boards of the Fortune 500, that would be great. Um, you know, the tough thing is, is you know, can people who believe that the government shouldn't be interfering in markets and shouldn't be manipulating the markets for the benefit of corporations get onto the boards of these corporations? It's it's really tough. It's sort of like government. Can you get a, a hardcore libertarian into Congress or into the White House? I mean, I'm a Ron Paul supporter. I realize that there's probably a lot some people out here who you know don't even support Ron Paul because he's you know he's viewed as you know too status um, you know uh, for hardcore uh, anarchists and, and I understand that you know but but he's the only one right I mean and and getting him into the White House you know even if you don't think that he's a, you know you know as pure as a driven snow you know even that is a monumental task you know but but if he were elected he would be the most libertarian president we've ever had in history and uh, you know. And, and it happens what maybe once every 300 400 years if we're lucky you know so getting these people into you know onto corporate boards would also be extremely difficult because uh, to do that they're, they're essentially fighting they're fighting against the, you know they have their ideals run up against uh, you know the uh, the function the, the purpose of these corporations um, which to a large degree is to maximize profit not through the free market but by any means necessary and if that means coercing government or allowing government uh, to use coercion uh, for the benefit of the companies then you know that's a problem but the more people that get the more libertarians that get into Harvard and Princeton and Yale and Stanford and Caltech you know the, the more that we get them out there in society absolutely we can go ahead and we can go ahead and bend the arc the other way uh, there's a guy named Allison at BB&T Bank former CEO uh, he was he's a libertarian and uh, they were one of the few banks that tried to uh, uh, reject the uh, the the bailout, um, and then the, the federal government came in and told them that they didn't have a choice, but they were actually going to reject the bailout. Uh, he gives all of all of his employees uh, back when he was the CEO, he gave all of his, his employees Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged and made them read it. You know, so if we have more people like him out there, yeah, uh, you know, the world would be a better place, and 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 freedom and liberty could uh, make headway even there in in the corporate world, um, and by sending kids to these schools, you know that that's how you do it. It's a lot easier to become uh, a board member if you're coming from Harvard and Stanford than if you're coming from uh, a state school. There's no question about it. What's my sense of the market needs and demand for services um, helping people who are looking to homeschool? Well, the the demand for services isn't very high, you know, and and I've jumped into it, you know, personally. Um, you know, trying to provide uh, solutions for people, and one of the great things about homeschooling is that that in order to homeschool a child, you know, all you have to do is love the child, <laughs> and if you love your child, you're probably going to do a better job than the public school system ever would. And you don't need to spend a lot of money uh, to love your child. You know, the biggest economic uh, sacrifice is not having a second job. It's not in pain for uh, curriculum and whatnot, but but most people homeschool don't spend that much money on, on uh, products. They spend uh, I, the last figure I saw was 600 bucks a year. Um, you know, two million people. You know, that's a lot of money, but but uh, I mean, it seems like a lot of money, but it but it really isn't in the grand scheme of things. You know, uh, because you know this money spread around so much. Um, you know, is there is there a market need? Is there a market demand for services? There is. Um, the problem is, is that you know it's such a fragmented market, and 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 what people are looking for is is so uh, different, you know, from child to child that it's hard to to be a good, effective provider of anything. That's why K twelve and, and and places like that, these large education companies, they service the homeschoolers, but they do a terrible job because they don't they don't care about your child. They don't they don't want to uh, tailor education to your child, and so as long as that's the case, you know. Their products are going to be, you know, pretty. Uh, they're not going to be very good for the child. And uh, you know, until we can figure out a way that we can get good products, you know, for all children, it's just going to be really, really hard. 
uh, to make money uh, in homeschooling. But uh, there's no reason for uh, parents not to homeschool themselves. Yeah, if homeschoolers do well at Harvard, as they should, that could encourage the ruling class to consider homeschooling themselves. Uh, they already are. You know, the, the thing is, you know, just just because uh, you know someone goes to West Point or Harvard doesn't necessarily make them bad. Just because someone homeschools doesn't make them good. You know, the elites, you know, have been homeschooling uh, for generations. You know, they certainly don't put their kids in public schools, um, and and uh, you know, to a degree that they can help their kids get ahead. Um, you know, become better developed people. You know, at, you know, from an intellectual standpoint, they're going to go ahead and take advantage of that opportunity. You know, they may do it for nefarious reasons. Um, you know, but but yeah, they're homeschooling. You know, the key is to get liberty lovers to homeschool. The average uh, American to homeschool, uh, and those homeschool kids are going to be much more open to the ideals of liberty. And when we get enough of them in society, then we have a chance to live a more free existence. Uh, in a more voluntary society, and uh, you know, and that's my goal: get the average American to homeschool. And, and if we get even 20% of the population to homeschool, it, it, it's 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 a seismic shift. You know, we go from a society that's very docile and apathetic, one who you know takes orders and believes the fairy tales that government tells us just because they're said by some expert, to one that is entrepreneurial, independent, uh, compassionate. Um, you know they question things uh, and and they move the world forward like that when that happens it's going to be fabulous and you know as much as I like to encourage people to get involved in politics um, you know to help push back and and try to fight for liberty um, you know none of that is going to uh, ever compare to uh, to scores of millions of Americans just waking up and I think that homeschooling is a way to do that. Montessori schools, I'm, I'm a fan in general. The problem with Montessori schools is that they're highly dependent on the individual uh, leaders of the Mont Montessori schools. There are some Montessori schools which are very effective for a lot of people, and there are some terrible Montessori, school, Montessori schools. Um, at the end of the day, you're going to love your child a lot better than someone else is going to love them. And so you want to do whatever you can to uh, position your child for... Uh, you know, success, you know, in their lives, uh, intellectually, morally, spiritually, however you want to define it. Um, you know, someone at a Montessori school, you know, may not have uh, those same interests. So, it's, it, you know, you, if you want to go into a Montessori environment, uh, just tread carefully. Uh, you know, talk to the teachers often. Uh, see what they're, what they're trying to do um, and, and see if it's working for your child. Um, I like the fact that it's less coercive. There's more freedom. That's all good. Um, but whenever you have a school, whenever you have multiple kids coming together from different uh, families and whatnot, you know there there is going to be some aspect of classroom management. There is going to be some aspect of discipline. There is going to be some aspect of authority. Um, even democratic schools, which uh, people where kids get to vote and have the same you know rights as as the adults in the schools, even even those schools you know have have those issues. So. You know, the, you know, it's it's trade-offs. It's trade-offs. You know, if, if you feel that you need to send your kid to a school for a certain number of hours a day, and that's going to be beneficial for them, you know, then I would say yes. Seriously, look at Montessori because Montessori is certainly um, more often than not a better option than public schools. But uh, you know, I think that everyone should try to figure out what's best for their child and best for the family. Um, uh, and, and 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 from that, you know, who knows what the answer is? I don't even advocate homeschooling or un unschooling for everyone. You know, I, I encourage people to figure out what's best for their kids, and I just at the end of the day believe that homeschooling and unschooling typically are a better alternative for most kids. Yeah, so I've been in Austin. Uh, this is Tyler. I've been in Austin here uh, since last December, and uh, you know, I haven't gone too tied into the scene here in Austin. I do know that there's a great homeschooling community uh, here in Austin. Uh, now that I'm I'm teaching homeschoolers uh, part-time, you know, I'm getting to meet more and more of them. Um, you know, homeschooling can thrive anywhere. You know, you, all you need to do is, 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 is just love your children, you know. Um, but if, if you're looking for a community of people who do it, then yeah, there's going to be certain areas that are more uh, conducive to that than others. 
One problem with homeschooling if you're not religious is that a lot of homeschooling communities are intensely religious. And to the degree that they're intensely, intensely religious and you're not, that can be very off-putting. A place like Austin, Texas and, and the homeschoolers in New York City, you know, they tend to go the other way. They're not only not religious, but they're anti-religious or, or uh, you know, sometimes like politically progressive. You know, that, you know, you, you just want to sort of find yourself, you know, in an environment that makes sense for you. And, and if you're geographically bound to an area that doesn't, then, you know, perhaps you should just avoid uh, those groups. You can still get your kids involved in great opportunities and activities that are academically focused or, or sport focused, um, but you don't necessarily, uh, you ne won't necessarily participate in the homeschooling uh, activities. Yes, the Montessori model can be integrated into homeschooling. Um, certainly, the uh, aspects of it can be. Uh, even even kids who uh, take public school curriculum into the home through these online virtual high schools and whatnot, they're going to do better uh, than their peers in the public schools because they can go at their own pace. They're not forced to to slow down because someone's slower than them or speed up because someone's ahead of them. You know, they don't have to deal with the distractions. Uh, you know, they don't have to deal with the socialization problems of public schools where there's fights and there's violence and there's peer pressure and all that. You know, so even in those cases, um, you know, the homeschoolers are going to do much, much better. Uh, you know, so if you're taking something like Montessori, which, which you know, I think has a lot of good things uh, about it and bringing that to the home, you know, that's going to obviously be better than just teaching public school uh, curriculum at home. So yeah, I think that you can certainly integrate uh, Montessori into homeschooling. Uh, you can integrate so many things. Each child is different and you should uh, try to adopt or adapt the uh, homeschool experience to their needs as much as possible. Okay, the best place to start for someone who knows nothing of homeschooling, I would say my blog. <laughs> so and it's a shameless uh, plug for my blog, but BeelerEducation.com. Um, I've been blogging since uh, February, and uh, you know it's just a uh, it's just a place that you can uh, you know see my arguments against public schooling and for homeschooling. You know, as far as like you know specifically, and and not just about me, homeschooling is 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 not it shouldn't be daunting it shouldn't be something scary you know public schools are horrible you know so when it comes time to send a kid to kindergarten just don't send them just keep them at home and keep teaching them at home you know you were able to teach them to speak you know you were able to teach them to you know go to the potty you're able to teach them to not you know throw food at people in restaurants you know that that's all teaching you know you you put you turn your kids over to a nanny or to you know a, a pre-k you know a, child center or something, they're going to be trying to teach your kid the same stuff that you taught them. And when it comes to reading, you can teach them reading. When it comes to math, you can teach them math. And the great thing about homeschooling is, you know, they'll eventually learn to teach themselves. And then it doesn't even matter if you don't know calculus, because they can teach themselves calculus. And they're going to do a much better job than, than uh, anyone at a public school ever could do for them, because they're going to actually care about learning. They're going to thrive on it. Um, you know, so, so I think that I mean, one of the things that I want to do is just take away this apprehension and fear um, of homeschooling, you know, because it's not as hard as people say. I mean, it's hard to, I mean, parenting is hard, there's no question about that, but, you know, the actual uh, process of, of helping your kids learn is just parenting. You know, you've been doing it since day one. You know, don't let other people tell you that, that you need a curriculum or that you need a certified teacher you know, to teach your kids because it's bunk, it's complete garbage. There was a study in Canada where uh, children of single parents who never graduated high school, and they compared them against their peers in the public schools, and the homeschool kids who were being taught by, obviously their parent who was uneducated and uncertified, scored over 50 percentile points better than their peers um, who were being taught by certified college educated teachers in the public schools. You know, 50 percentile points is huge. It's, it's half the population. Um, so if uneducated, uh, uncertified, you know, single parents who are probably financially uh, 
uh, insecure can do that much of a better job in public schooling, you know, just have faith that you can certainly do it as well. I'm going to go ahead and uh, type in a couple things. Here's my Twitter feed, Beeler Education. Here's my Facebook page, which is uh, you know focused entirely on homeschooling. And this is my my web page, um, my blog, which also has my uh, uh, has my biography on it. Um, you know, which which might be helpful for some of you. And then um, for those who just want to be friends with me on Facebook, I will go ahead and post that up as well. Um, I post most of my education stuff on my Beeler Education page on Facebook. And uh, my personal page, I touch upon education sometimes, but uh, I'm, I just attack government uh, often. And uh, I'm a huge supporter of Ron Paul. So if you don't like Ron Paul, you might not want to friend me on Facebook because you'll just be seeing a lot of uh, posts about Ron Paul. Oh, oh, thanks so much, Oliver. I appreciate it. Um, hopefully I was helpful. And uh, I'm going to also put my email down here. If any of you have questions about um, homeschooling, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, I love Liberty Lovers, um, and, and I will I'll do whatever I can to, to help at least point you in the right direction. My pleasure. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining. Really appreciate it. I am going to uh, log off here uh, so that the next person can get on. But it's been wonderful. I love this community, and thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Have a great day.